we yield remarkable results. Over the last three years, the partnership between Japan and the United States has been transformed into a truly global partnership. And that's thanks in no small part to the courageous leadership of Prime Minister Kishida. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, there was lots of praise for Prime Minister Kishida throughout the uh, remarks from President Biden uh, in terms of everything from uh, what's happening globally, not just economics. I think that we often get swallowed up in that when we talk about our relationship with Japan. But there's so many other things. Uh, the president also, uh, in addition to the economic ties, uh, talked about some of the other common goals to increase prosperity in the two countries. On the economic front, our ties have never been more robust. Japan is the top foreign investor in the United States, and we, the United States, are the top foreign investor in Japan. Nearly one million Americans work in Japanese companies here in the United States. That was one of those uh, think again moments, I think, uh, in the course of that context uh, that uh, under the surface, I don't think many people realize that uh, we are one another's greatest foreign investors, U.S. being the number one foreign investor into Japan, Japan being number one foreign investor into the U.S. Over a million jobs uh, are held by American citizens uh, through Japanese companies. Uh, so there are real clear ties and important ties there. Uh, and then, of course, when you start looking at the geopolitical dynamics of all of this, uh, Prime Minister Kishida, in his remarks, spoke about a new direction of Japan, strengthening their defense capabilities, increasing their defense budget, which has been a very slow uh, thing for Japan since World War II, a big turnaround from previous Japanese policy. Uh, and obviously, a lot of that has been dictated uh, by the aggression of China and North Korea, other actors in the region. Uh, so here's Prime Minister Kishida. This is coming through a translator during the co press conference. Japan is determined to strengthen our defense force through acquisition of counter-strike capabilities, increase our defense budget, and was reassured by President Biden of his strong support for such efforts. We confirmed again the urgency to further bolster the deterrence and response capabilities of our alliance. So clearly Japan has uh, gotten itself on a different footing as it relates to defense. I think with uh, what China has done in the region, what uh, North Korea continues to do, in the region uh, that uh, they feel like they have to do some things uh, to bolster their ability to defend themselves. And of course, they look to the U.S. as a crucial partner in all of that. And uh, we'll be getting later on in the week as we talk about these uh, tri-country uh, uh, talks that will take place tomorrow with the Philippines, U.S. and Japan, uh, also looking to bolster security in the region. Prime Minister Kishida also mentioned China directly. Uh, saying that they'll work together to deal with the challenges regarding China and, tai and the Taiwan Strait, important shipping lane there, uh, and work with the country to make progress towards common goals. We agreed that our two countries will continue to respond to challenges concerning China through close coordination. At the same time, we confirmed the importance of continuing our dialogue with China and cooperating with China on common challenges. We also underscored the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits and confirmed opposition to encourage peaceful resolution of the issue. So I think those are uh, crucial parts of that conversation. One of the interesting moments for me in the press conference with the Prime Minister and President Biden uh, was talking about North Korea. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida has uh, been outspoken and saying that he would engage in talks with the North Korea. Korean uh, leader, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, and many have criticized him inside of Japan and in the region uh, for engaging. And it was interesting that President Biden uh, responded and said, no, we should be willing to have conversations, not without conditions, not without uh, getting a few things straight. Uh, but th that idea of having dialogue uh, was a crucial thing that both of the leaders said we need to have happen. President Biden mentioned his conversations uh, with the president, uh, with the prime minister of China, uh, President Xi, and uh, that we have to have dialogue, that having dialogue is better than not having dialogue. And so I thought that was an interesting component to all of this. President Biden also uh, answered a reporter's question about the most recent conversation he had with the Israeli prime minister, uh, really taking this to a global scale, talking about the ongoing efforts to free hostages held by Hamas and bring more aid to the people of Gaza. 
Bibi and I had a long discussion. He agreed to do several things that related to number one, getting more aid, of both food and medicine into Gaza, and reducing significantly the attempts, the civilian casualties in any action taken in the region. And it's tied to the hostages. We we'll get these hostages home where they belong, but also bring back a six week ceasefire that we need now. So we'll see what he does in terms of meeting the commitments he made to me. So all of that from the press conference today in the Rose Garden, a great setting uh, for the leaders of the two nations of Japan and the United States, Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden, uh, going through a wide range of topics and a lot of underlying questions. Uh, again, we talk about those butterfly questions uh, that have a ripple effect. And uh, many of them seem small and insignificant. Some of them seem purely economic. But by the time the press conference was over, you could see how interconnected all of this was and how it connected to China, to North Korea, to Russia and Ukraine, to Israel and Hamas and Gaza. Uh, they're all interconnected. It is a complex world. Uh, and those little underlying questions are often the things that we need to think again about. And uh, today, the president and the prime minister began that as it relates to the U.S.-Japan alliance. We'll be right back. April in Utah means warmer temps, spring runoff, and yes, road work. For every spring surprise, rely on KSL News Radio. Tim Hughes and Amanda Dixon cover what happened overnight from 5 to 9. Dave and Debbie and Boyd Matheson have in depth conversation during the day. And Jeff Kaplan takes you home with his trademark minute of news. All season, every day. We have you covered on KSL News Radio. Get in zone, AutoZone. Welcome to AutoZone. What are you working on today? Brakes? We can save you 15% on that. We have OE quality Duralask brake pads and rotors in stock, ready for pickup or delivery. We also have calipers, brake fluid, tools, and anything else you'll need to do the job right. When you get Duralask pads and rotors together, you'll save 15%. It's just part of what makes us America's number one brakes destination. Hey everyone, it's Ted from Consumer Cellular, the guy in the orange sweater, and this is your wake-up call. If you're paying too much for wireless service, you don't have to keep having that nightmare. Consumer Cellular has the same fast, reliable coverage as the leading carriers for less. And for a limited time, new customers receive their second month free when they sign up and use promo code MONTHFREE by May 31st. So why keep spending more than you have to? Seriously, wake up and call 1-888-FREEDOM or visit ConsumerCellular.com. Taxes, fees, and other third-party charges will apply. See website for additional details. In this market, you'll find Fisher Investments is different than other money managers. Different how? Aren't we all just looking for the hottest stocks? Nope. We use diversified strategies to position our clients' portfolios for their long-term goals. You don't just provide cookie-cutter portfolios? No. We tailor our clients' portfolios to their goals and needs. But you still sell investments that generate high commissions for you, right? No, we don't sell commission-based products. We're a fiduciary, the highest standard of care for a financial advisor. It means we're obligated to act in our clients' best interest. So when do you make more money? Only when your clients make more money? Yep, we have one transparent management fee structured, so we do better when our clients do better. Sounds like you really look out for your clients. We do, because our priority is helping them achieve a comfortable retirement. That might be why most of our clients come from other money managers. Visit FisherInvestments.com to find out why investors like you switch to us. Fisher Investments. Clearly different money management. Investments in securities involve the risk of loss. Advertising used to be simple. Your options were radio, TV, newspaper, and let's not forget the yellow pages. Now it seems like a tidal wave of options. Podcast, cable TV, streaming, OTT, CTV, audio network, smart speakers. On top of that, you need digital marketing for your website along with SEM, SEO, display, video, YouTube, email, and all the social media platforms. Look, you're the expert in your business. Wouldn't it be nice to have an expert to market you? We are Bonneville Salt Lake, the local marketing and media company you know and trust. We reach customers across all digital and social platforms and have the reach of traditional advertising available as well. We find your customer anytime, any place, anywhere on any device here in Utah or anywhere in the world. We work to optimize your results with our in-house local team of experts, providing you with qualified leads, not just impressions. Contact Stephanie Palmer at KSL for a 
free consultation, including a complete digital audit with no obligation or cost to you. Email spalmer at ksl.com. That's spalmer at ksl.com. In the history of the world, nobody has ever said, yay, we need a new roof. But when things aren't quite right up there, don't wait. Call IWC Roofing, the highest rated roofing contractor in Utah. IWC has been in business since 1997, and they offer the best value pricing in Utah, along with the best warranty in the business. They're one of the few Owens Corning Platinum Certified Roofers in the entire state. They have their own installers, no subcontractors crawling around on your roof. And at IWC Roofing, they'll send you pictures from up on the roof to show that you're getting exactly what you paid for in most cases, they'll re-roof your home in one day. They'll clean up and pressure wash your driveway. IWC roofs more homes than any other company in Utah, so they can offer you a better price. And right now, an extra fifteen hundred off your new roof. Call IWC Roofing for a no pressure quote. Eight zero one two three two fifty six ninety. Call eight zero one two three two fifty six ninety, or go to iwcroofingutah.com. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bonas. First, Chad Daybell's attorneys outlined how they plan to challenge the evidence in their opening arguments at his murder trial in Boise. Second, the managers of Panguitch Lake taking steps to lessen the danger from a crack in the dam. And third, does a computer-generated image break the law banning child pornography? California's legislature could ban AI porn. 59 degrees, sunny in Salt Lake City. And back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Boyd Matheson divides rage from reason on Inside Sources. We're going to take a look now at the very complicated dynamics between the U.S., the U.N., Israel, everything that's happening there in the Middle East. And things got even more complicated over the last 24 hours as the United States and the Biden administration has continued to push Israel and Hamas to agree to a six to eight week ceasefire uh, that would allow obviously more aid to go in uh, to the innocent uh, Palestinian civilians there inside of Gaza. And the big component to make all of that ceasefire work, of course, is the release of hostages. And over the last 24 hours, uh, Hamas has uh, been negotiating, again, with uh, Israel and others uh, in the region. Uh, the talks have been go- ongoing in Cairo, Egypt, with uh, Qatar really serving as the, the main mediator uh, with Hamas's leadership, uh, who are mostly uh, hunkered down in the Gaza Strip somewhere. Uh, and so as you look at that deal uh, that everyone seems to be in favor of, from the UN to the US, um, other allies around the world, everyone I think wants to get to that ceasefire. But of course, the critical component to that is the those that have been taken hostage and been held for over 187 days. Uh, there's there's nothing uh, about that 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 works. <laughs> hostages are hostages; uh, they shouldn't be there. But over the last 24 hours, Hamas has told negotiators that it can't do the deal because it doesn't have 40 Israeli hostages that it can release as part of a temporary ceasefire deal with Israel. So that admission raises all kinds of questions about the remaining hostages. Uh, At this point, the, the number is 133 hostages out of the 240 that were abducted on October 7th and the addition of about 1,200 that were killed uh, on the Israeli side of the border, uh, 133 hostages are are unaccounted for. And so if Hamas is saying we only have 40, and then uh, this is also a group, they said there are some that are Israeli soldiers, both male and female Israeli soldiers, that they're unwilling to give up at this point. Uh, But the question then is what, what else has gone on uh, who is still alive, who has the the others. Uh, and so there's a whole host of questions. So I think the talks just got immensely more complicated uh, because that will uh, be a, a line, I think, for the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, to say, wait a minute, uh, if the hostages are not alive, we should know that. Uh, if they're being held by someone else other than Hamas, that needs to be known. Uh, or if you're just unwilling to say who you have and who you don't have, it's tough to negotiate. 
And while everyone agrees that uh, getting more aid in is important and steps have been taken uh, in the over since last weekend, since uh, President Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu had their last uh, direct conversation, uh, there has been additional aid going in. Not enough by anybody's standard, I don't believe. Uh, but it does get it more complicated and more uncertain and less clear in terms of what the path forward is. And, and part of this is a lot of confusion, even inside of Israel, uh, because of the mixed messages coming out of the United States. Uh, just last, late last week, uh, as we covered here on the show, uh, you had on one day you had very stern, uh, very blistering remarks from from President Biden towards Benjamin Netanyahu in terms of what needed to be done following the the killing of innocent aid workers uh, who were delivering food uh, and supplies uh, to citizens there inside of Gaza. And the same day, the announcement of of the initial uh, the additional sale of F-16 fighter jets, weaponry, and, and arms uh, as part of that deal. Uh, and so that sends a whole host of mixed messages. Meanwhile, inside of Israel, it's also very complicated and complex. Benjamin Netanyahu is clearly not popular at the moment inside of Israel, even amongst his own people. And a lot of his own allies are starting to splinter uh, as they see that it's going to be very difficult for the prime minister to hold on to power inside of Israel for very long. And many have accused uh, Benjamin Netanyahu of simply dragging things out because it preserves his power. Uh, his chief rival, Benny Gantz, who's also part of the war cabinet, uh, is now calling for early elections this September. Uh, and according to everyone we've talked to, uh, Gantz would easily lead uh, Netanyahu uh, and take over the prime ministership. Uh, so that's an interesting dynamic, uh, even inside of what's going on in Israel. Uh, we've been critical of Benjamin Netanyahu over the course of the last summer uh, with a lot of the things that he was doing to uh, centralize power, uh, strip some of the power away from their Supreme Court, move it into the executive branch. Uh, and so there's a lot of challenges and, and things going on for Benjamin Netanyahu inside of Israel. So that creates additional uncertainty. And so then the question becomes, so what is... What is the United States' role? And part of these mixed messages that the Biden administration has been sending, uh, sending have also come uh, under some speculation and some criticism from people inside the administration and outside the administration, people that are traditionally President Biden's allies and those that he's uh, usually at odds with, uh, that there doesn't seem to be a clear, cohesive strategy or message as it relates to Israel uh, and the relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu. And obviously, Israel has been a, a staunch ally uh, and partner of the United States in the region for a long time. Uh, those things, I suspect, will continue, uh, but things are getting more complicated. And then, of course, you have things going on at the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations, of course, passed a resolution uh, calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, and the only reason that passed was because the United States... Uh, abstained from voting. Because remember, as a permanent member of the Security Council, the United States has veto power. Uh, there's been a number of resolutions about ceasefire, including those put forward by the United States that were vetoed or voted against by China and by Russia. Uh, and so a lot of this has kind of gone around and around. And so then the question becomes, now that the United Nations has passed a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire, what is the United States' role? Uh, and all of this goes to a lot of the confusion and a lot of the uncertainty, I think, in terms of the U.N. of late. Uh, the U.N. resolutions that are written uh, without enforcement measures uh, can't force Israel to stop. Uh, what its leaderships insist is a justified war necessary to remove Hamas and prevent another October 7th massacre. Uh, but it's also uh, critical that the, uh, what the entity can make Israel stop. Uh, and and it isn't. Uh, and that's what the United States is and isn't doing as it relates to that U.N. resolution. Uh, and so all of this uh, leads us back to the question of where do we go from here? Because to me, that's the real question in terms of leadership. Um, because if we can't get to a clarity in terms of direction, 
and this is where it's leadership and influence uh, for the United States. Clearly, uh, the United States cannot dictate to Israel uh, what it can and cannot do for what it feels is its own security and protection. And clearly, Hamas complicates that by continuing to put out statements that there will be more October the 7th style attacks. Uh, that gives Israel more reason to say we have to defend and we have to stamp out Hamas. They're clearly out uh, to the end uh, to make sure that they wipe Israel off the map. Uh, meanwhile, you've got the hostage situation. Now we're not even certain how many hostages are alive or how many of them are in the control of Hamas and how many may be held by other groups inside of Gaza. So it's all getting uh, more complicated, not less. It's a little more muddy than it is clear. Uh, but the thing that is clear in my mind is that we have to get to a different kind of conversation uh, in terms of what the go forward strategy is. How do you balance those things in terms of protection uh, and national security? How do you make sure that innocent civilians uh, are not being targeted and that they are getting the aid and the help that they need? Uh, and that's going to re require leadership that we haven't seen on the world stage from any country, including the United States, in quite a while. All right, we'll step aside for some bottom of the hour news. We'll come back. More inside sources coming up next. It's 1.30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bomas. KSL's top story this hour. We have breaking news out of Philadelphia. A massive police presence has gathered around a mosque in Philadelphia near the scene of a shooting. WCAU-TV reports police haven't yet provided details on the incident. 47th Street and Wyalusing Avenue. It was first reported about an hour ago. Uh, today is Eid al-Fitr, beginning the holiday that marks the end of Ramadan. The National Weather Service has escalated the flood risk in Panguitch to a level two. Wade Matthews with the Utah Division of Emergency Management spoke with David Dejanovic this morning, and he's optimistic the current efforts are helping to stabilize the dam there. The elevated flood risk is meant to help people be more aware of the situation. Out of the necessity of, of caution that it's been escalated, but again, you know, we're working to, today to try to, to mitigate that and hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. Matthews estimates residents would have about two hours to evacuate the area if the worst case scenario were to happen. Your money at this moment, the Dow Jones average uh, down 457 points on the day right now, and the NASDAQ is down 156. We have sunshine and warmer temperatures on the way. That's next. KSL News Time 131. We hope you have the right app on your phone for news. You probably have dozens. But the KSL News Radio app, well, it makes our live stream super easy. Plus, our talk shows are right there as podcast for your workday. That's the app for KSL News Radio. Do you hear that? Asthma triggers are everywhere from dust mites, pet dander, and pollen to smog and smoke. An asthma attack can strike anywhere, anytime. <laughs> Be prepared with quick-acting Primatine Mist. Clinically proven to open airways quickly. It's the number one FDA-approved asthma inhaler available over-the-counter. Primatine Mist. Breathe easy again. Use as directed. Every business faces challenges, but complicated, expensive, and uncertain shipping shouldn't be one of them. With USPS Ground Advantage from the United States Postal Service, you can avoid all the noise. No more unexpected surcharges, hidden fees, or complex rate structures. It's just easy, cost-effective, and dependable shipping. Tune your business's frequency to success and turn shipping to your advantage. Learn how at usps.com slash advantage. USPS Ground Advantage. Simple, affordable, reliable. What's up, everybody? I'm Mike Wilson with Any Hour Services, and there's a good chance you've heard me talking about our free furnace sale. The one where you buy a new air conditioner and we give you a new furnace for just the cost to install it. About 400 bucks. Well, we still have a few more spots on our schedule we need to fill, so I'm extending the sale, but I'm not quite sure for how much longer. Definitely no later than April 30th, and once I think our schedule's full enough, I gotta pull these ads, so don't wait too long to call and schedule your free estimate. 
the main reason we do this sale is to give you an incentive to help us keep our guys busy when the weather's mild. And thanks to your help, we're able to keep our guys and keep growing. So if your furnace and air conditioner are ready to be replaced, you owe it to yourself to at least schedule a free estimate and get all the details about our free furnace sale. Just to recap, when you have any hour services install a new air conditioner, we'll give you a new furnace for just the cost to install it. About 400 bucks. The furnace is free, you just pay the labor. If you think you might be interested, call any hour services at 801-443-7400. You can Google any hour services. You can even schedule online at anyhourservices.com. No one helps more homeowners than any hour services. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's DinoPay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meeks. Valley Freeway traffic is looking good. No accidents, no delays. We do have a crash in Midvale. This is at 700 West, just above 7400 South. SNS Roofing is your trusted source for quality and affordability. They have they've been the top roofing company in Utah for over 40 years. Schedule an estimate now. Get a free quote at snsroofinginc.com. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. Sunny skies with rising temperatures today and tomorrow. Clouds will move in Friday and Saturday, but temperatures stay warm with highs in the mid to upper 70s. 59 degrees and sunny right now. I'm Dan Bonas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside Sources. America's Voice of Reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson, and we're going to go into the deep dive of the law of unintended consequences uh, in some interesting spaces that will actually impact you. Uh, Could uh, Congress be taking a swipe at your credit card reward points? And uh, is uh, some of the action by the Federal Reserve and by Congress as well-intentioned as it may sound, as good a bumper sticker as it may be, is it going to end up hurting you in the end? Uh, Someone who understands this uh, better than anybody I know, Eric Baim is a reporter at Reason. And uh, Eric, welcome back to the show. Hey, boy, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, so this is one of those things where you say, now, wait a minute. Uh, The president in his uh, State of the Union address uh, has been uh, pounding the pulpit uh, and the podium a lot in terms of what he was going to do to get rid of things like junk fees and airline fees and all of these things. And some of these sound great. They're good. They're good campaign slogans. But when you start playing them out, the the, uh, results are not always uh, quite as good as it sounds. Yeah, that's right. We've heard a lot from President Biden uh, over the last couple of years, you know, on and off about uh, this war on junk fees. One of the, uh, you know, actual things that the administration has done uh, in in that, you know, conflict, if you will, is uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau last month acted to put a cap on uh, on uh, credit card late fees. So uh, going forward, credit cards won't be able to charge people more than eight dollars a month in late fees. The administration says that's basically what it costs to, you know, go through the process of collecting, uh, collecting and processing and handling late payments. So the credit card companies get that, but they will no longer get to profit off of people. Uh, and so late fees have been capped. Away, you know, so it's a much lower uh, level, eight dollars a month, down from about. Uh, about $32 per month on average is where they were before. And it sounds great. I think, you know, obviously nobody likes paying late fees. I hate it when I forget to make a payment on my credit card and I get dinged with one. Uh, but uh, economists say that the, you know, the consequence of this is going to be probably higher interest rates for everybody, you know, marginally higher mm-hmm. interest rates for everybody just to offset that amount. And uh, possibly, you know, harder to get credit for some people, people who have maybe don't have a good credit history or have no credit history. Uh, riskier, you know, people who are, who are at greater risk from the credit card company's perspective, uh, they may have a harder time getting access to credit cards because, uh, you know, they're just not going to be as willing to take a, a risk on somebody like that. So puts credit out of reach for some people means all the rest of us pay a little bit more. Uh, you know, that's that's the way these trade-offs always work. You don't hear about that side of it, though, from the White House. Yeah, there, there's always a trade-off. That's the, the I think that's also a law. <laughs> there's always a trade-off of some sort or another. Uh, and so again, it, it sounds good. Hey, let's let's reduce those. No longer have those big thirty-two uh, dollar late fee payment. And it's only eight. But again, if you end up paying higher interest rate, if it's harder to get credit, 
who are we helping and who are we hurting uh, in the end? And and uh, you also took on this whole element that uh, got my attention today. It's like, wait a minute, now they're going to come after my reward points? Explain that one to us. Yeah, that's right. This is a separate thing, but but <laughs> similar, you know, similar related yeah. issue for sure, because, it, yeah, both deals with credit cards. This is something that Congress is talking about doing. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I should say just to, to close the loop on the on the other part of this, the junk fees thing at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, Congress may try to undo that because there's been a bill now introduced by Senator Tim Scott uh, to use the Congressional Review Act to stop the, mm. uh, the, the Financial Protection Bureau from, from doing that one thing. Meanwhile, while Congress is potentially <laughs> stopping that, Congress, on the other hand, uh, you've got Senators uh, Dick Durbin and J.D. Vance. Uh, that's the Democrat from Illinois, Republican from Ohio. So there's this bipartisan effort uh, to pass a bill that would uh, artificially cap the swipe fees that are charged by credit cards uh, to businesses. So every time you go to a, to a, a coffee shop or go to a bar and you use your credit card, uh, you, you, know, you get charged the bill. Uh, a percentage of that, a few pennies of that transaction come out, and uh, that's the the swipe fee that's charged to the uh, cover the basically the transaction costs for the credit providers. Um, and those swipe fees, you know, they add up because we use our credit cards so much, and they're the, the things that basically fund any sort of reward program. So whatever it might be, cash back or travel points or whatever you get from your credit card, that's all funded through those swipe fees. Uh, there's this bipartisan effort now, though, to, to limit those because they say this is, you know, this is an added burden and added cost on consumers and businesses, and uh, that credit card companies are basically just profiting off of, uh, you know, how popular and, and often their their product gets used, which doesn't seem like a bad thing to me, but that's the argument here. Uh, and uh, so attempting to, to cap these fees, uh, again, you got the law of unintended consequences here. What's going to end up happening is uh, you're going to end up losing, you know, consumers that like these these credit card reward uh, programs are probably going to end up losing out because those will go away if the, mm. if the money that funds them doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. You used the example in uh, your piece today uh, with the uh, debit fees. Uh, going back to, to Dodd-Frank, explain that for us, because I think that's a, a great example of, hey, here was the, the great uh, cheering of uh, this is what we're going to do to protect the little guy. And in the end, uh, not so much. Yeah, that's right. This is what I'm talking about here, these unintended consequences. This is not theoretical. We actually know exactly what's going to happen because we went down this road a decade ago. Uh, Dodd-Frank, that was the, the massive bill, the huge financial regulatory package that was passed uh, in 2010 in the wake of the you know the big uh, the great recession the financial collapse all of that uh, buried in there there was uh, there was a, a provision that that capped debit card swipe fees so not credit card but debit card swipe fees uh, that's the money that at the time uh, banks were getting off of those swipe fees and then banks were using that pile of cash to fund a whole bunch of programs that were beneficial for consumers, including things like free checking accounts and all sorts of reward programs, things that don't exist anymore because they were uh, they were basically done away with uh, by Dodd-Frank. So the, the great irony here is that uh, when when debit card use the debit card usage has, has declined as a result of this because consumers have now flocked towards credit cards because of the rewards programs that credit cards offer that debit cards no longer really can offer because they don't have the, the financial incentive there to do it. Uh, and then credit card swipe fees are frequently actually a higher transaction cost for businesses than the debit card swipe fees ever were. So a provision that was put into this law to protect businesses from being gouged by the, the banks with these debit card swipe fees actually ended up pushing consumers towards credit cards, which have bigger swipe fees, which means consumers ultimately are, you know, are still paying a, a fraction of all these transactions. Uh, and it means that the businesses are still getting, you know, still getting a hit for those costs uh, at the end of the day too. So uh, yeah, I mean, Congress, this is, this is the repeated story, I think of regulation in Washington, whether it's the federal bureaucracy doing it, whether it's Congress doing it, uh, you know, you can always try to cap one thing or set a price on one thing, but the consequences are always going to be beyond what the policymakers think they are. Yeah, and I think that's so interesting. You actually pointed to a 2013 study uh, from the University of Chicago that just talked about that in in real terms, in terms of what happens and what doesn't get passed on to consumers. Uh, just just walk us through that real quick. 
Yeah, that's right. There was a couple different studies, actually. A 2013 study by some economists at the University of Chicago found that uh, merchants saved about $7 billion annually from the uh, from the, the capping of debit card fees in the Dodd-Frank law. Uh, but those savings ended up not actually being passed on to consumers. So rather than the banks getting that extra money, you know, all the businesses that otherwise would have been charged those swipe fees just, just kept the extra cash. Uh, and uh, so, you know, consumers didn't really see any benefit there. But on the other hand, that same study found that consumers lost more on the banking side than they gained on the merchant side, meaning that the, the loss of things like the debit card reward programs, free checking accounts, all of that uh, actually outweighed the supposed uh, benefits that they were going to get from the uh, capping of those fees. Then another more recent study, 2022 study by some researchers at Georgetown and Yale, found that the uh, the end of those debit card reward programs, as I was saying, nudged consumers towards using credit cards more often, and that credit cards often have higher swipe fees for businesses uh, than the debit cards ever did. So you end up with the consumers not getting the benefit that they were promised from the law. Uh, the businesses just kept the extra cash that they weren't being charged anymore by the, the transaction costs. And then the, you know, so the consumers lost out, and then the businesses also lost out because now they're paying higher swipe fees on a, a different type of transaction. Uh, so, you know, again, here you've got federal officials meddling in the economy, trying to do something that they say will fix, uh, will, you know, make, make uh, consumers and, and businesses better off. And uh, it looks to me like it actually ended up doing neither of those things. Exactly. And this is our ultimate lesson in unintended consequences today. You need to go to Reason.com. Check out both of Eric's pieces, uh, both on the rewards points, the swipe fees, also the late fees, and just how it sounds good on the front end. Uh, but you got to watch the back end. That's where the results actually matter. Eric, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Springtime in Utah, and if you're a business owner that hates to paint, do what business owner Al did. He called Rhino Shield. I was watching TV one night and saw the Rhino Shield ad, and I thought, well, if they can do a house, they can probably do a building. Rhino Shield ceramic technology is formulated for our unique climate here in Utah and is Class 1 fire rated. So they came out and uh, they gave me a price, showed me how the Rhino works, how it lasts, and how the guarantee works. Utah residential or business, get the 25 year guaranteed protection of Rhino Shield right now for. 15% off the regular price. They, they waited for us to leave, and they work Saturday and Sunday, so they wouldn't affect our business at all. This was the great part of it. I came back Sunday night, and you couldn't even tell they were here. There was no paint on the ground. They did a fantastic job. Utah, this offer is limited, so call 435-246-4466. 435-246-4466, or visit rhinoshieldwest.com. Rhino Shield. Sign up for KSL Text Alerts and you could win cash. Text the word cash to 57500 for a chance to win $250. That's cash to 57500. Plus, you'll get breaking news and traffic updates right to your phone. Want to win more prizes? Text contest to 57500. Jazz fans, text the word jazz for breaking Utah jazz news. And Cougar fans, text BYU to 57500 for the latest on the Cougars. Message and data rates may apply for an alternate entry method and complete contest. Test rules. Go to kslnewsradio.com. Hey everyone, it's Ted from Consumer Cellular, the guy in the orange sweater, and this is your wake-up call. If you're paying too much for wireless service, you don't have to keep having that nightmare. Consumer Cellular has the same fast, reliable coverage as the leading carriers for less. And for a limited time, new customers receive their second month free when they sign up and use promo code MONTHFREE by May 31st. So why keep spending more than you have to? Seriously, wake up and call 1-888-FREEDOM or visit ConsumerCellular.com. Taxes, fees, and other third-party charges will apply. See website for additional details. What's keeping you from learning the language you've always wanted to speak? Too hard. Takes too long. Not with Babbel. Babbel's interactive lessons, podcasts, games, and more make learning fun. Fun isn't hard. Right. And in 10 minutes a day, Babbel's bite-sized lessons are designed to get you having real conversations in as little as three weeks. That's not long. It's not hard. It's, it's perfect. perfect. It starts here. Go to Babbel.com to try for free. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Babbel.com. IVC is celebrating 20 years providing quality service in Utah. You've probably heard their saying by now, life starts when the pain stops. IVC is the most trusted interventional and vein center in the state, and they've been voted best of Utah Valley 10 years running. The seven physicians at IVC provide state-of-the-art, comprehensive vein care with many years of experience. The team at IVC takes the time to get to know you and your veins so you're comfortable with the right diagnosis and the right treatment. 
Patients are like family at IVC. You've also heard many radio ads over the years with real people describing how IVC has dramatically improved their quality of life by eliminating the pain and discomfort caused by varicose veins. Well, what are you waiting for? Don't let vein disease slow you down even one more day because life starts when the pain stops. Visit iVein.com today to set up a free screening. That's iVein.com. Get up to a 20% bonus and up to 12% per year guaranteed for your retirement income. These guarantees are too good to pass up and can give you lifelong income security. Up to 20% up front just for opening an account and up to 12% per year guaranteed. Call Trajan Wealth today. 801-899-7600. That's 801-899-7600. Or visit TrajanWealth.com. Guarantees are based on the claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company. Jazz fans, secure your seats for the next NBA season by getting season tickets. Season ticket members get special perks like team store discounts, savings on in arena concessions, and more. Be there for every moment during the 2024 25 season by calling or texting 801 355 Dunk today. 801 355 Dunk. Let's go, Jazz. Common Spirit Health, hospitals, clinics, and caregivers all connected to advance health care in Colorado, Kansas, and Utah. Health care with human kindness is here. Hello, human kindness. Social Security is with you through life's journey from birth to retirement. As your life changes year to year, so do your needs. For over 80 years, Social Security has helped to meet your needs and is committed to improving access to the services that make a difference in your life. Today, you can verify your earnings, estimate your future benefits, apply for retirement, manage your benefits, and even change your address, all from the comfort of your home. Social Security's online services help put you in control with secure access to your information anytime, anywhere, allowing you to spend more time with family, friends, or simply just enjoying the day. Social Security, securing today and tomorrow. See what you can do online at socialsecurity.gov. Produced at U.S. taxpayer expense. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, there's a massive police presence around a mosque in West Philadelphia where a shooting's been reported. Second, President Biden is hoping Hamas will respond to another ceasefire proposal that could bring Israeli hostages home and third, the safety situation with the Panguitch Lake Dam might be getting a little bit better. Right now, 61 degrees and sunny in Salt Lake City. And back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Boyd Matheson divides rage from reason on Inside Sources. Well, as we've been reporting, the Biden administration has had an idea as part of their education policy, and that is to make the process to apply for financial aid easier. The program is known as FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A, helps millions of students to get help uh, from the federal government to attend college. The challenge, however, has been that the implementation of their plan wasn't quite as easy as they thought. We've heard this before. Uh, it is always takes longer and there's always more glitches than you think, but now the glitches in the system have delayed thousands and thousands of students from even applying for, let alone receiving, aid. It's created a lot of uncertainty, a lot of frustration by university and college admi uh, administrators, as well as students and families who are trying to figure out where they should send their students to college based on what kind of aid they might be able to receive. Not long ago, I spoke with a reporter at Reason.com, Emma Camp, who's been following this story very closely, and she gave a, a great breakdown of what went wrong and, more importantly, the impact it's having on students and parents. Here's part of that conversation. Okay, so to start off with what's happening with the FAFSA, the Education Department has really bungled it this year. So in 2020, Congress passed a law that required the FAFSA to be streamlined, to make it a, a simpler form to fill out. That sounds like a great idea, right? 
Well, the education department seems to have had a hard time doing this. So they had a really long delay in getting the FAFSA form out. Normally it comes out in October. This year it didn't come out until New Year's Eve, mm. and they didn't extend that deadline for families. And almost immediately when students and families started filling it out, they started facing these really infuriating technical glitches. You know, people were having a hard time logging in. They were getting locked out. The form was having all of these kind of nonsensical technical bugs. And a lot of them were affecting people really long term. So just until, you know, a couple weeks ago, um, if you have a parent without a social security number, which is mostly students who have an undocumented parent, you couldn't fill out the form at all. Um, and just recently, the Education Department announced that they uh, miscalculated the estimated family contribution for 200,000 students who had reported their own financial assets, things like cash savings or investments. Um, and this is really putting people's college decisions at risk, right? Uh, the FAFSA form is required if you want to get federal grants and loans, and it's required by the vast majority of colleges if you want to get financial aid. Yeah, and so let's uh, let's dig into some of those components. So one, uh, not surprising, uh, things don't tend to run on time when they're making those kinds of changes uh, in government programs or systems or processes. Uh, and so, but it's stunning to me that they uh, they didn't get this done not in the fall, but it went all the way to New Year's Eve. But there was no change in the deadline that had to be uh, infuriating for a lot of folks. Oh yeah. For sure. I'm sure there's going to be many families who aren't able to get the form in on time, especially families that have other issues that have kept them from being able to fill out the form until recently. Yeah, and let's, and let's talk about some of those uh, downstream impacts uh, as it relates. You, you mentioned it briefly, but I want you to unpack that for us a little bit in terms of the requirements for those who want to get some of that federal aid or, or federal grants having to really suspend or, or put off uh, making some of those crucial decisions. Yeah, this is really going to throw a lot of people's plans up in the air. This, this form is absolutely required, like you said, if you want to get federal grants and loans. And also for, you know, a lot of people, most people apply to multiple colleges, you get different financial aid offers. And most of those colleges rely on the FAFSA when deciding how much financial aid to offer to students. And, you know, college decision day is May 1st, if I remember correctly. Um, and, you know, parents and students want that information before May 1st so they can decide, you know, are they going to choose the cheaper school? Um, and, you know, the way this is going, by the time people have to decide where to start their education, they're not going to have all of the really important financial information that they need. Yeah, and obviously that's going to impact a, a lot of things, uh, in, including how some of those schools function rolling into the fall. If, the, if there's not a certainty in terms of who's actually coming and showing up, what those needs are. Uh, and uh, I want to actually get to the parent portion that you just alluded to. The, the students not being able to decide on May 1st uh, is one big deal, uh, but parents not really knowing, hey, are we going to have to pick up another job or are we going to have to sell some assets or change some behavior in order to, to make ends meet are just not going to be able to make those kinds of decisions. Right. This is so infuriating for university administrators who just don't have the manpower to individually calculate how much financial aid they're going to give to every student. It's infuriating to parents. And uh, some schools, you know, there, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal about this. They're, they're already reporting that they're getting fewer FAFSA forms from students. So that was my conversation with Emma Camp from Reason talking about this uh, poor rollout. Uh, again, it's called FAFSA. It's the Federal Student Aid uh, and getting that in. And with these changes that the government made, the Department of Education has made it absolutely impossible for students, for families, and for colleges to work through the whole process. So this is one of those things where it goes to the agency. Again, Congress made a rule, a law, and then the agency's supposed to carry it out. The agency drops the ball. And so now it's coming back to Congress. In fact, it came back to Congress in a big way today. And Utah Congressman Burgess Owens, uh, who was uh, acting as the chair of the Higher Education and Workforce Development Subcommittee, uh, was leading the hearing today. And uh, he weighed in on uh, some of the failures in this rollout. And here's how he began the hearing today. Here's Utah Congressman Burgess Owen. With the financial burden of colleges growing each year, it was incredibly important to reform ease the fast growth process for families. The new, new law streamlined the long, complex application process. Today, the committee is poised to, for a familiar challenge, oversight. Despite our efforts, the Department of Education's fast for rollout was mired in delays and dysfunction. 
Without accountability, the Department of Education botch implementation threatens implementation threatens to damage students, families, and institutions. Representative Owens went on to talk about the effect this pro this problem is going to have on the education system and downstream. These failures are not just impact the taxpayer who always pay the cost of bureaucratic dysfunction. Institutions could be seen as an estimated of 20% drop in enrollment this year. Low-income students who require access to aid are going to be the hardest hit. And these delays don't even account for next year's FAFSA, which will almost certainly be uh, not be ready by October. Within three years, the Biden administration, uh, Department of Education, has managed to bring the educational industry to a possible game-changing crisis. It, it is a crisis of credibility across the board. It was interesting, uh, uh, Rachel Feldman, who's the vice provost at the, uh, for enrollment at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, told the, the committee uh, and uh, Representative Owens that the school typically has all, all of the financial aid offers out uh, to accepted applicants by the end of March. And now here we are on April the 10th, and they have not sent out a single one. Not a single aid offer has been extended to a single student uh, who has applied for aid and admissions at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and so you can see this uncertainty in how this all unravels. Uh, and this is one more area where if we want to have trust in the institutions, the institutions have to do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. Because the more we undermine that confidence and that credibility, uh, the more problems we have in terms of uh, just our civilians and our citizens really having confidence that government can get anything done. This was a form, a process, but it's impacting thousands of students and families and universities and colleges across the country. One more problem we got to get straightened out. All right, we'll step aside for some top of the hour news. Come back with a big hour number two, including a conversation with J.D. Tachilli of does America want a dictator or are we just making one? We'll get into that coming up next. Stick around. KSL FM Midvale. KSL Salt Lake City. From the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. This is KSL News Radio. Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. It's 2 o'clock at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bombas. KSL's top story this hour we have breaking news out of Philadelphia. At least two people have been shot near a mosque in the Parkside neighborhood. A witness told CNN this happened as people were marking Eid al fitr the end of the holy month of Ramadan. We were enjoying ourselves. The kids was running around, everyone was eating, and at about 2.30, we just heard shots. WPVI-TV reports at least four people have been taken into custody. One police officer also fired his weapon, not known if that officer hit anyone. Here in Utah, the remains of a man who's been missing for almost two years may have been found in Box Elder County. 19-year-old Dylan Rounds was last seen near Lucen, near the Nevada state line. The medical examiner is working on a positive identification. A suspect in Rounds' disappearance, James Brenner, was charged with his murder a year ago. Your money at this moment, the Dow Jones average, uh, down on the day now, 422 points. The NASDAQ, down 136. And our KSL weather, sunshine through most of the week. That's next. KSL News Time 201. It's a priority for us at this station to bring you all sides of a story and to talk about the news fairly, completely. Get all the facts and be really aware. Utah's Morning News with us, Tim and Amanda. Weekday mornings, 5 to 9 on KSL News Radio. Are you stressing about your IRS tax problems? Have you received notices from the IRS threatening to garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, or seize your property? You need an ally. Allies Tax Relief has tax attorneys and enrolled agents that are ready to fight for you. They have saved millions for taxpayers just like you. Allies Tax Relief can help put a stop to IRS collections and most importantly, negotiate your tax debt. Here's Brenda, a happy client of Allies Tax Relief. 
I owe the IRS around $57,000, and they're about to start garnishing my paychecks. I heard a commercial on the radio about Allies Tax Relief, so I thought I'd give them a call. After a day, they were able to at least stop the garnishments, and after a few months of negotiations, I walked away owing the IRS only $301. If you owe the IRS, call Allies Tax Relief right now for your free consultation. Call 800-230-5174. 800-230-5174. That's 800-230-5174. 5174. Business. It's all the things that keep this world turning. And behind every one of these companies is a partner helping to keep it all moving. It's why the local flower shop and your favorite pizza joint, the startup and the stadium, hospitals and hotels, banks and restaurants nationwide all choose the advanced network, cybersecurity solutions, and round the clock trusted partnership from Comcast Business, the company that powers more businesses than anyone else. Comcast Business, powering possibilities. See why Comcast Business powers more small businesses than anyone else. Get started with fast speeds and advanced security for $49.99 a month for 12 months with a two-year contract. Plus, ask how to get up to an $800 prepaid card with a qualifying internet package. Don't wait. Call or go online to switch today. Ends 5524. Restrictions apply. New customers only with 50 megabits per second internet and security edge. Eagle Bell and auto pay required. Equipment, taxes, and fees extra. Hi, Doug Wright here with one more little experiment you can do at home in a pan of water. All you have to do is stir in limestone, calcium, magnesium particles, and then heat that whole mess up on the stove. And you know what? On second thought, not such a good idea because limestone, calcium, and magnesium particles heated in water will clump and stick to your pan like concrete, which incidentally is exactly what's going on inside your water heater. Think about it. Limestone, calcium, magnesium, that's what makes hard water hard. And trust me on this, if you live in northern Utah, your home has hard water. So call Connecticut of Utah. I'll give you the number in a moment. They'll test your water's hardness for free, and they'll show you the patented design features that make Connecticut water softeners work better than any other. Connecticut of Utah, an authorized Connecticut dealer. To learn more, call Connecticut. It's 801-576-8600 or log on to softwaterutah.com. And call now while it's on your mind. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. Right now, we do have a closure in place for Little Cottonwood Canyon for maintenance and avalanche mitigation work taking place there. And an auto pedestrian accident called out at Highland Drive, about 3400 south. The best kept secret is this is the pass. It's a pass for fun for everyone. Now through April 30th, save $20 off every annual pass level. 362 days of fun. Visit thisisthepass.com. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. And a KSL weather, sunny skies with rising temperatures today and tomorrow. Clouds will move in Friday and Saturday, but it'll stay warm with highs in the mid to upper 70s. Right now, 61 degrees and sunny. I'm Dan Bomas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Well, in America, we always say we don't want a king. We don't want a dictator. Those are always the headlines. We're free. We fought a war over that against England 250 years ago. But the question beyond the headline and the thing we need to think again about is, while we say we don't want a dictator, are we actually creating one? Let's begin. Think you know the news of the day? Think again with Boyd Matheson on KSL News Radio. Yes, democracy is messy. It feels slow and cumbersome, and often it fails to live up to the principles we profess to believe. Uh, in American democracy today, uh, far too much time is being spent on pounding on opponents or political parties, and it is actually doing the work of the people. And so how do we change that, and how do we do that without actually giving ourselves a king? Uh, if you don't read anything else today, this is the Read of Reads today. It's by our good friend J.D. Tuchilli. Uh, he is the contributing editor at Reason, and uh, the piece is actually titled Americans Don't Want a Dictatorship, But They're Creating One Anyway. J.D., welcome to the show. 
Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Always great to have you. And uh, I knew this was going to be where we wanted to start hour number two. The moment I saw your headline today, and then the more I read, the more I thought, "Oh, this is so on the money." Uh, and so let's uh, let's start with the premise of this. We always say we're a free country. We don't want no stinking king. We don't want a dictator here. Uh, it seems like we are actually creating one. Describe that for us. Yeah, we're kind of inching in that direction, and it's actually more than inching. It's kind of creeping pretty fast. Yeah. And a big part of the problem is Americans are kind of ambivalent about the idea of restrained government and a restrained presidency. Um, I was ripping off, uh, riffing off of a recent poll by AP NORC, uh, Center for Public Affairs Research at the University of Chicago, and they headlined it about, you know, half of Americans uh, think it will be bad if the next president is able to act on important policy issues without the approval of Congress or the courts. And only about uh, 21 percent think it would be a good thing. And I mean, it is good that more Americans think that would be bad than think it would be good. But this is a 250-year-old republic, and really we can only get 48 percent of respondents to say that turning the presidency into an absolute monarchy would be bad. Um, I mean, I just find that a little surprising. Yeah, but we, the we, thing is that – yeah, go ahead. I'll keep going. <laughs> well, I was going to say it, it's actually supported by other polling. There was mm. a poll – by University of Virginia Center for Politics in 2021, which found that a similar 20 percent of both Trump and Biden voters strongly agree it would be better if a president could take needed actions without being constrained by Congress or courts. And the previous year, the Democracy Fund Voter Study Group found that over three annual surveys, about 24 percent of Americans say that a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress elections is a good way to govern a country. Now, that's only a, you know, a fifth to a quarter of the population, but really consistently only about half think a dictatorship is a bad thing. Wow. Uh, and that's uh, that's what worries me, uh, because it's it sort of become in our politics. Uh, I used to always describe it as the Dennis Rodman syndrome, like everybody hated Dennis Rodman when he was the basketball player. He was dirty. He was cheap. He was wild. He was out of control. And nobody hated him more than the Chicago Bulls right up to the point. He became their Dennis Rodman. <laughs> and even though he was still awful, horrible, terrible on all of those fronts, he got him, you know, 21 rebounds, several steals, and wreaked havoc on the other team's uh, best player. Uh, and so now it's sort of become the same thing in our politics of, well, if, if my team's got the power, if my team has the White House, then yes, I definitely want a presidency who can not have to wait on Congress to actually get things done. Oh, that's absolutely true. I mean, and, and the the pollsters ask people, OK, if you're a Democrat and Biden wins in November, what do you say now about an unrestrained presidency? And the numbers in favor of it doubled. Um, they asked Republicans the same thing, and the numbers almost tripled. Um, and the fact is, people are much less opposed to the idea of dictatorship if they think it's their dictator. And when they ask you know, more deeply, OK, are you which branch of government do you think has too much power? It's always a branch of government that's in somebody else's hands. Mm. Republicans think the presidency and the executive branch is too powerful. Democrats think the Supreme Court is too powerful. Of course, the Supreme Court is uh, leans conservative, and the and the presidency is, is held by you know Democrat Joe, Joe Biden right now. The fact is, Americans really don't like restrained government um, if they're the ones exercising power. They only want to restrain if it's the other guy in power. Yeah, as long as it's my dictator, then it's okay, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. And the fact is they're getting what they want. Um, we had run a, another piece, and I quoted from it. It's by Gene Healy, who wrote a book, The Cult of the Presidency. Yeah. Uh, it came out about 15 years ago, although it's just been revised recently because, frankly, the presidency is getting more culty. And he pointed out that um, over decades the presidency has been accumulating more and more unilateral power as people ask the government to do more and more. And the president is the face of the government, the most obvious you know, singular face, and people keep on handing off more authority to the executive branch because they want the president to fix everything to the point now where presidents can do stuff like – Try to you know try to absolve people of owing the student loans. Try to uh, you know uh, you know pass um, executive orders that kind of legislates um, unilaterally. Um, we're not at an elective monarchy yet, but we're getting very close to that point. And the fact is that there's a, there's a significant constituency out there for an elective monarchy, so long as they think it's somebody on their side who's exercising that power.
Yeah. And so as we look at that, and I think there's a, another element to this that's really fascinating to me, and that is, uh, so we have citizens who are looking to Washington more and more to solve any big problem, whether it's a student loan problem, whatever, whatever it may be, look to the president, look to the executive branch to just do it with the stroke of a pen. We also have Congress that continues to abdicate authority to the executive branch so that they don't have to be held accountable for things. And that also helps to consolidate that power in a an elected monarchy. Oh, absolutely so. I mean, we've seen that in terms of war powers, where Congress doesn't want to be, you have to go through the messy, you know, um, act of, of engaging in violence. They delegate it to the executive branch. A lot of laws these days are kind of written with broad frameworks with the details be filled in by the executive branch. And then Congress just does nothing some, you know, a lot of the time. Yeah. Now, the fact is, Congress not passing a law doesn't mean it's a do-nothing Congress. If Congress mm. votes down a law, Maybe that's the something that, that they're supposed to be doing. But if they're just stuck and if they don't want responsibility, if they just want to pose before cameras and then pass responsibility off to the executive branch, we are going to end up with an empowered executive branch and a legislature that kind of becomes vestigial. Yeah, it's, uh, such a, a powerful thing in all of that. And then, of course, the, the problem with all of that in the current model, without a real monarchy, is when the executive branch does things by the executive order, then somebody files a lawsuit that works its way up to the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court becomes incredibly political, uh, and we wonder why. Well, exactly so. I mean, if you have uh, a presidency that becomes – kind of the fulfillment of people's hopes, wishes, and fears. And the only check on it, um, to one extent or another, is, is the, going to be the Supreme Court. They're going to be seen at odds with each other. And those who favor whatever they're, you know, whoever is in the White House at the time um, is doing are going to resent the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court is going to be the rally point for those who oppose that president of the White House. So, And that's exactly what we're seeing, of course, in the numbers with Republicans kind of supporting the, uh, the, the Supreme Court against the presidency. Democrats supporting the president against the Supreme Court. I mean, that's exactly the uh, the dynamic that's taken place in recent years. Yeah, uh, this is a great piece. J.D. Chichilli, uh, one of the best of the best, uh, contributing editor at Reason. It is your must-read assignment for the day. Americans don't want a dictatorship, but they're creating one anyway. J.D., as always, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. All right. Uh, great perspective there from J.D. And... Uh, uh, we'll come back with some more inside sources as we look at this whole idea of the fact that uh, we say we don't want a dictatorship. We say we don't want a king or a monarchy or a queen, uh, but a lot of our actions are leading us that way. And as J.D. points out in the piece, that it is really uh, not just uh, inching, it's, uh, it's starting to creep and creep a little faster. And so that requires all of us to take a look at where is that balance of power and do we like that unlimited power or unrestrained power when it's in our favor when our person is in the white house or when our team is in control of congress or the court uh, that's not how it's supposed to work and so the important thing for all of us is to make sure we're looking at that uh, not just uh, who has the power and is my team winning uh, we have to look at it as what's best for the country and what's best for the future we'll be right back Think again on Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson. Hercules Credit Union is your place to go if you're looking to grow stronger financially. They've been doing this since 1946, offering the best of financial services to the community. And it's about community. It's never about a transaction with Hercules. It's about a relationship. Right now, you can uh, get a uh, home equity line of credit from Hercules, 3.99% for the first six months on any new home equity line of credit. No origination fees. Visa access card to make it easy to access your funds. Uh, also, they have great gold tier checking, which uh, allows you to not only earn points on everyday purchases, redeem for great uh, travel uh, gift cards, e-cards, and so on. No monthly fees, ultimate in, uh, identity theft protection, peace of mind, all with gold tier checking uh, it's all about Hercules Credit Union and growing stronger together because it's about having a relationship, not just a series of banking transactions. You can find their locations in Taylorsville, Harriman, Riverton, or Salt Lake City, or as always with our friends at Her Hercules, you can find them online at HerculesCU.com. Ready to name an NHL team? This deal makes too much sense, and an announcement could come by the end of the season. Jazz owner Ryan Smith is warming up the home crowd with possible names for a hockey franchise. What's the future of the downtown? Hockey in Salt Lake City and Utah sports generally. Listen this week to KSL News Radio. When the weather warms up, it's like a stampede. 
Except instead of dust stirred up by hundreds of hooves, it's a cascade of phone calls to advanced window products. This is Jeff Kaplan. Soon as the sun shines and the snow's gone, people want new windows and frames from Utah's number one custom window maker, and the wait for installation grows longer. But right now, you can get near the front of the line by calling for a quote and get $2,500 off when you purchase 10 windows or more. That's on top of the incredible savings for the highest quality double pane windows and frames, any style, any color. See, at Advanced Window Products, they actually build the windows here in Utah, they install the windows, and they guarantee them for life. There's no middleman, and they can pass the savings on to you. They even offer buy now, pay later. So get in before the wait grows longer and get the $2,500 off. Get your new windows this spring. Make the call. Advanced Window Products, 801-850-9100. That's 801-850-9100. Or visit advancedwindowsusa.com. Hey, guys, do you know your T-Level? Revive Men's Health here in Salt Lake City is helping you take that first step toward better health and enhanced intimacy with a free testosterone level test, exam, and consultation. Plus, for this month only, qualified patients can kickstart their treatment with a free supply of ED medication. Call Revive Men's Health Salt Lake City at 801-263-7777. That's 801-263-7777. Or visit revivemenshealth.com. Getting help with electrical repairs is easier than you think. All you have to do is call Any Hour Services or schedule an appointment at anyhourservices.com. No one helps more homeowners than Any Hour Services. Mom and Dad used to argue about everything, especially about Dad's drinking. It drove me crazy. It got so bad, I couldn't do my homework. I couldn't concentrate. I absolutely refused to let any of my friends come to our house for any reason. I would have been humiliated if anyone found out how much my dad drank and how loud my mom screamed at him. My family went from totally crazy to quiet, calm, and even peaceful. The only thing that happened is my mom started going to Al-Anon family groups. Her relationship with my dad really changed. I asked mom if she would take me to her Al-Anon meetings or to Alateen. I wanted to see if I could have a better relationship with my dad. I'm sure glad I did. If someone's drinking troubling you, you might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al-Anon or Alateen family group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or go to alanon.org. Being 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. Managing today's uncertainty can be overwhelming. We crave security, and it's uncomfortable when we sense a lack of control over our lives. Develop a routine for a more balanced lifestyle with healthy habits and fun. Focus on what you can control, even if it's little things, like a before bedtime ritual. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. At Social Security, we are always thinking of ways to save you time and make things easier. That's why we created My Social Security. Opening a My Social Security account gives you secure access to your personal record and interactive tools tailored for you. You can see if you are eligible to receive benefits, view spousal benefit estimates, and compare retirement benefit estimates at different ages or dates when you want to start receiving benefits. Already receiving benefits? Use your account to change your address, set up or change direct deposit, get a proof of income letter, and more. In most states, you can also request a replacement social security card. Save time, go online, open a My Social Security account at ssa.gov slash my account. Social Security, securing today and tomorrow. Produced at U.S. taxpayer expense. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, at least two people have been wounded in a shooting near a mosque in Philadelphia. Second, authorities in Box Elder County believe they've located the remains of a man who disappeared almost two years ago. And third, witness testimony is underway this afternoon in the Chad Daybell murder trial in Boise. 61 degrees and sunny in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Inside Sources. Inside Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. The presidential election in November promises to be a close one once again. And you can tell by the way the candidates are scrambling and crisscrossing the country and particularly focusing on the swing states. 
Republicans and Democrats alike are desperate to get their majority to the voting booths and in some cases keep their opponent supporters away. So how have voting laws changed since the last election? What does that mean uh, for what takes place at the polls, our confidence and trust in the system, and how this will all play out come November, not just at the top of the ticket with presidential elections, but down ballot races that are so crucial to the country as well. And so we want to look at some of the new voting laws in swing states and what that's telling us and how that might shape the 2024 election. Uh, really pleased to have joining us on the program, Patrick Marley, national reporter for The Washington Post, uh, focuses on voting issues, particularly in the upper Midwest. And Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so let's dive into this. Uh, this is one of those where, uh, depending on where you fall on across the political spectrum, you might find might find it a little easier, or you might find it a little harder uh, to vote this coming election. Tell us what you're seeing in your reporting. So the first thing to keep in mind is that we've seen a lot of changes to election laws in 2020 as the pandemic emerged. Every state changed its voting laws. They um, made it easier to vote in some ways. Many states sent absentee ballot applications to all voters. Some states even sent actual absentee ballots to all registered voters. States set up curbside voting programs and uh, expanded vote by mail, had drop boxes. And so you saw this dramatic change to all states' elections. After the 2020 election, every state then made new changes. Um, Some states I decided to make those 2020 changes permanent or to further expand their uh, laws that made voting more convenient. And other states went in the other direction and, you know, not only went back to pre-2020 policies, but in some cases uh, put in place new restrictions on early voting or absentee voting. And so what I looked at were the, the swing states, you know, seven states that are probably going to be determinative of who wins the election. And you see these dramatic differences, places like Michigan, Uh, has uh, an expansion of voting opportunities in places like North Carolina, um, have some new restrictions and new policies that uh, mean some absentee ballots that would have been counted in the past would not be counted in the future. Yeah, and that's so interesting. And so uh, I I thought it was uh, fascinating, your piece in the Post, uh, talking about places like Michigan expanding, uh, North Carolina uh, making it – kind of upping the the bar there in terms of expectations. What else did you see in that? Where else are you seeing some of those changes and shifts? And uh, is it, is this really just kind of a, a tale of uh, depends on where you fall on the spectrum? Well, it, it does track closely with, um, you know, the states that have Democratic majorities and Democratic governors made voting, uh, you know, increased opportunities for voting, had more ballot drop boxes, more hours of early voting. States with Republican control tightened their laws, made changes that um, maybe made it, you know, tightened deadlines for getting in absentee ballots, maybe had fewer polling hours, increased opportunities to challenge a voter's, uh, another voter's ballot or their eligibility to vote. And then in states like um, Arizona and Wisconsin, where you have mixed control, you know, divided government or a governor of one party and a legislature of another party, you see, you see sort of the same uh, thing that you had seen in the past. Like, you know, the legislature passes something and then the governor vetoes it, or the governor proposes something or tries to do something uh, and the legislators won't go along with it. So in, the, in those two states, Wisconsin and Arizona, it's really pretty status quo compared to 2020. And then in um, a state like Pennsylvania, you see sort of uh, uh, changes that go in both directions. The new governor there implemented automatic voter registration. So anybody who goes to the DMV to get a new license or renew their license gets to put on the voter rolls unless they don't want to. They proactively opt out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, some changes made to absentee ballots. They have some sort of, sort of idiosyncratic rules about uh, handwriting uh, the date that you return your ballot onto an envelope. And a court just ruled that if you if you fail to do that, um, you know, which some voters write the wrong date or they don't know they're supposed to write the date, uh, then those ballots will be rejected. Yeah. As you've gone through this and uh, you really did a, a great deep dive uh, on this. And again, regardless of Republican, Democrat, left, right, all of that. Uh, to me, the interesting question that you get to that I think is the real crucial one in all of this is, is that balance and and having the compatibility of of access and integrity, I think those are the the real keys to making sure this uh, constitutional republic keeps rolling in terms of uh, free and fair elections. 
what did you learn or what surprised you in that process of looking at how we balance that access, making it as easy as possible or as convenient as possible, and also upholding those high standards of integrity so we have confidence in the election as well? Well, I think it is true that you hear from partisans this, you know, one party is talking about one half of the equation and the other party is talking about the other half of the equation. And they sometimes get into some pretty overheated rhetoric about it. Um, I did talk to one law professor who she sort of emphasized the point that really these are popular ideas. If you talk to most average people and you ask them, do you think everyone who is eligible to vote should have a reasonable opportunity to conveniently vote, they say yes. And then if you ask them, do you think that there should be protections and measures in place to ensure that you know, voter fraud doesn't exist and that there are some inconveniences like a voter, photo ID law uh, that would um, ins- ensure greater trust in the system, voters tend to say yes. So the opinions about the voting system don't I think always track with the kind of messaging we hear from the, you know, uh, very ideological Republicans and very ideological Democrats as they talk about this stuff. Yeah, I think that's so important. This often becomes just one more of the uh, fake fights and false choices because I think these are compatible principles. I think they have to be compatible principles if we're really going to have elections that everyone has confidence in and everyone can participate in. I think, uh, as you said, sometimes in the even in the polling, the way the polling is set up. Uh, often gets us to the wrong, maybe gets us to a, a correct answer, but to the wrong question. Uh, as you pulled those apart, I think that's the that's the real key there. Is there anything else that you're watching for uh, in the coming months that might impact some of those critical swing states and some of these new laws that are on the books? I mean, I think it's also important to like put yourself in the shoes of a specific voter. You know, these we're talking about probably a handful of votes that are, you know, when you, when you change a law, it can seem really monumental and it, and it is, but really in terms of what, whether it's going to affect the outcome is only going to be the case if it's a very close election. Um, But if it's your vote, if it's your ballot, that's not going to be counted, then you may feel differently about it than if you think about it in more abstract terms. Yeah. Uh, Great insight. This is a great piece. You should check this out at The Washington Post. Patrick Marley is the national reporter for The Washington Post, focuses on voting issues, particularly in the upper Midwest. Patrick, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right. Again, that's Patrick Marley, national reporter for The Washington Post. And uh, this is just one of those that I think is so crucial to the conversation that we have to get to this idea of compatible principles, that access to the ballot box, that ability to vote, and integrity of the vote, those are compatible principles. And bringing those together is what will make sure we all have confidence in the results of the elections. We'll step aside for one last break. Some final thoughts for Inside Sources coming up next on KSL News Radio. Stick around. It's 2.30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bomas. KSL's top story this hour. 15-year-old reportedly shot by police at a celebration marking the end of Ramadan at a mosque in Philadelphia. Gunfire broke out this afternoon, and uh, police opened fire. One witness told CNN she was just having a fun time with the kids when the gunfire broke out. A couple seconds later, it was like another round of shots going off, and we were just running and running, and... One of my family members got shot in the stomach. Police say five people have been taken into custody. A police officer fired a weapon during the incident, and that's when the 15-year-old was reportedly wounded. Utah First Lady Abby Cox is now out of surgery, performed on her spine this morning at the University of Utah Hospital. The governor's office has released a statement saying after weeks of debilitating pain, the First Lady had the surgery to remove degenerative discs in her neck. They say they're looking forward to her making a speedy recovery and resuming her duties soon. Your money at this moment, the Dow Jones average uh, is uh, down, closing trading actually, 422 points down on the day. The NASDAQ was down 136 points, the S&P 500 down uh, 49 points. And we'll see sunshine the next couple of days. That's next. KSL News Time 231.
here's a way to get breaking news updates anywhere you go. At the store or in a work meeting, you can get breaking news on your phone. You can quickly read it, swipe, or click for more. It's super discreet, super fast. That's the app for KSL News Radio. It's going to be here before you know it. Here comes the summer, like a wave of change. Soda Weight Loss wants to help you look amazing in your swimsuit and shorts. But you got to get started right now at SodaWeightLoss.com. No time? Try Soda's at-home program with all the support you need online. I didn't realize how unhealthy I was. When you start losing the weight, even that first five pounds, this enormous amount of confidence starts to build in you. You start to realize like, oh, this is possible for me. That's Lauren, and she let go of 35 pounds with Soda. With their help, I let go of 70 pounds in five months. That's because soda works. soda works. It's why they have more than 8,700 Google reviews and countless before and after pictures and videos of people loving their results. Get started now at SodaWeightLoss.com. That's S-O-T-A WeightLoss.com. Sodas, say it with me. Say of the art. Beat the spring cleaning rush with big savings and priority booking by calling Zero Res. Dust, dander, and bacteria are living and breeding in your carpet, upholstery, air ducts, and more with nowhere to go. The spring season allergens such as pollen are coming out of hibernation ready to invade your home. Check out the 3,300 raving customer reviews with a 4.8 Google rating and see what the hype is all about. This month, get three rooms zero resified from Salt Lake's number one carpet cleaner starting at just 99 bucks and they'll throw in a free hallway. Plus, take 25% off your air duct cleaning to get that true spring cleaning feel. Call Zero Res right now, 801-288-9376, or go online to ZeroRes.com and say you want the KSL special, Zero Res. Spell it backwards or forwards. It's the right way to clean. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's DinoPay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. Little Cottonwood Canyon is closed at this time. They're hoping to reopen that at about 3 o'clock. We have an accident eastbound I-80 at about 7th East on the right and a crash 4500 South 3rd East. Murdoch Hyundai, home of Tucson SEL. Lease for only $375. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. Sunny skies with rising temperatures today and tomorrow. Clouds move in Friday and Saturday, but temperatures stay warm with highs in the mid to upper 70s. Right now, 59 degrees and sunny. I'm Dan Bomas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside, Inside Sources. Sources. America's Voice of Reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. We'd all like to see a little less dysfunction and a little more function in Congress these days. And one of the obstacles to move legislation forward at a proper pace is the current rule regarding the motion to vacate the chair. Uh, in the House. Uh, today, it's far too easy for disgruntled lawmakers to threaten to replace the Speaker of the House, throw the process into chaos. We saw this play out last year, of course, with the uh, ouster of then-Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Uh, however, uh, previously, under Nancy Pelosi, it was uh, pretty hard to vacate the Speakership. It actually required uh, real consensus uh, in order to get to that, if that was going to be the case. So we want to take a look at where it is and what actually could be done to make this a little better process while still preserving the things that are there within the Constitution. Uh, and there's a way to get about that. It's having the right conversation as opposed to a lot of this performative politics stuff that we have seen. Uh, someone who's taking a look at how we really take the positive steps toward transforming Congress in this space. Robert Oldham is a social impact fellow at New America and a Ph.D. candidate at Princeton University. And Robert, welcome to the show. Hi, Boyd. Thanks for having me on. Uh, great piece in Politico with a couple of your colleagues there. Uh, give us a, a little sense. Obviously, we've seen the drama playing out in Washington uh, this week uh, with another threat from uh, uh, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene in terms of this vacating of the chair. Uh, but break it down for us in terms of uh, kind of the better way. If, if we want to have this, why do we have this rule to begin with? And then how do we make it actually be a little bit more productive? 
Yeah, so the, the motion to vacate uh, currently where you just have to have one member um, bring forward a motion that can pass on a majority of the House, this was uh, put in place at the beginning of the 118th Congress when they were forming the, um, you know, kind of uh, negotiating over who, uh, to get McCarthy into the speaker position and to uh, to try to, uh, you know, just kind of get ready for the, the session to start. The conservatives that were not voting for McCarthy, this was one of the uh, the demands that they wanted. Was they wanted a motion to vacate where where one member could um could basically say if we want to have a vote on getting rid of the speaker, we can have the speaker. McCarthy tried to negotiate that down, like you know he wanted it to be at least five members. He wanted you know he tried various things to make it so he wouldn't kind of face this gun to the head, but um but it didn't really work. They demanded the one member motion to vacate, and so that's what he got. Yeah, and uh, so our proposal. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I want to get into, into your proposal. And, and obviously under uh, Speaker Pelosi, that was not the rule. But give us kind of the origin story of the rule, why why it's in there, uh, and then why it has changed. Um, well, the, the uh, I mean, it, it's essentially a, uh, a motion of no confidence. You see these in you know, most legislative settings where you can – where you can vote to um, to get rid of the uh, the speaker, you know we've uh, we've seen this used back you know far far back in House history. It was you know threatened at least against uh, Speaker Joseph Cannon back in the uh, the early 20th century. So you know it's just kind of it's, it's a feature of legislative politics. I would say that you know there's a yeah. mechanism available to the, to the uh, to the legislative body in order to uh, to get rid of the current leadership if they don't like it. Yeah, and and, and of course that's a that should be a, a proper thing within a legislative body. Uh, and I think again historically it's required a little more than one. Uh, usually it's been at least half or some large number, so it would have to do that. You you and your colleagues have a really interesting proposal that I think is worth thinking about. Uh, that doesn't get rid of the idea of vacating the chair, but it it causes it to be something very different. Explain it to us. Yeah, so we're basically uh, proposing instead of a vote of no confidence, um, which is what the uh, the current motion to vacate allows, it is a, a motion of a constructive no confidence. So you see this in other democracies. Uh, Germany and uh, Spain, for example, both have this, um, where basically the rule says that if you are going to um, pr- you know propose to get rid of the current government or, you know in our case, House leadership structure, if you want a new speaker, then on the motion where you said we're going to get rid of the speaker, so you know we're going to get rid of Mike Johnson, you have to specify who's going to replace Johnson as mm-hmm. a result. So this is basically you know what happened back in um, you know last uh, last fall when they got rid of McCarthy, they replaced something the McCarthy leadership structure with nothing. So you know you can think of this as a decapitation of the House. With let's be honest, there was really no plan to replace what was going to come after McCarthy. So this kind of gets away of the you know the idea that you can just go up and go in and blow things up and then, you know, walk away, you know, let the bridge burn behind you type type thing. You actually have to have a plan in place and, you know, someone who can take over a speaker um, that the people that are vacating or, you know, voting to get rid of the speaker that they agree on. So, you know, obviously yeah. this would probably be difficult for, you know, very conservative Republicans and then, you know, Democrats, you know, you, you need a considerable number of Democratic votes to, uh, to get rid of a Republican speaker. It would probably be very difficult for them to come together on a consensus candidate. So this would, um, this would take a lot of the, uh, you know, the chaos inducing, uh, nature that we saw in that previous motion to vacate, that would be gone. Yeah, and I, I think there's something to that. Uh, one, removing the chaos, this whole idea of replace, replacing something with nothing, uh, but it would force those who want to vacate the speaker or replace the speaker to say, hey, we think so-and-so, we, we think candidate A should be the speaker or representative B should be the speaker, uh, because that sh- shows the cards and some thought much more than just, hey, we don't like this person because they didn't give us what we wanted, so we're going to ouster them. Uh, it requires much more, and I think that would completely change the conversation in terms of what uh, that might look like actually on the floor of the House. Yeah, it would certainly allow some of these uh, these speakers the uh, the ability to probably sleep a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit easier at night, knowing that um, you know, obviously in politics there's lots of many different factions and you know many different people that are gunning for you at any moment. But it's often easier for them to come together and you know be opposed to something rather than come together and you know, actually offer offer a new plan. So if you're you know Mike Johnson or you know whatever speaker comes next in our history, knowing that your your um, your opponents actually have to agree on something other than the fact that they just don't like you. That's probably going to make your life a little bit easier. Yeah, I don't know if it makes the speaker sleep any better at night, but they would at least be able to govern better during the day. And I think that's actually the <laughs> the the real purpose there to to get uh, people to a, a point where they can function from a position of of strength and confidence, 
uh, as opposed to functioning from a position of weakness uh, where every move and every conversation, someone's going to be offended or counter offended or preemptively offended uh, and threaten your speakership. I just don't think that's any way to, to govern a country uh, or a Congress. Uh, so as you look at this moving forward, uh, as you've shared this idea, any any traction there, any uh, allies or, or common cause folks that, that might say, hey, this is something that we ought to be talking about? I doubt anything's going to happen before the next election, but maybe in the new Congress at the January of 2025. You know, yeah, I, I would also be surprised if anything changed before the end of this Congress. But um, you know, hope springs eternal, I guess. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, you know, there's a you know, people who have you know kind of proposed ideas similar to this one. You know, at least at the very least, different from the the one person motion to vacate. Like you mentioned, the fact that under Pelosi, you had to have a, you know majority of at least one party had to sign on to the motion to vacate. So that that in itself would be a, would be a positive change. Um, Representative Tim Burchett, who was actually one of the members of the uh, the original rebels that ousted McCarthy, he's also suggested something similar hmm. where um, you would have to have unanimous agreement among Republicans on who the next uh, speaker would be if you're going to get rid of the current speaker. So, you know, we've seen some of these ideas percolating up. Um, you know, I don't think Americans are often, you know, looking to other countries to kind of see how we <laughs> should do things. Um, you, know, you know, we have a, obviously a unique political system, so there's there's some reasons for that. Um, but uh, you know we've you know, we've seen uh, you know this work in other countries, and I think uh, you know there's reason to think that this could be a um, you know some, something for reformers and for members of Congress to think about going. Yeah, forward. definitely. This is definitely something worth thinking about for sure. Robert Oldham, Social Impact Fellow at New America, PhD candidate at Princeton University. Great piece uh, in Politico today. Check that out. And uh, Robert, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on board. Take care. All right, it's uh, Robert Oldham, uh, Social Impact Fellow at New America, and uh, great, it is a great piece. Uh, I hadn't thought of it in these terms, but I do think it's worth thinking again about in terms of this simple rule, and, and it sort of played out with Kevin McCarthy, uh, who was so determined to become the speaker that he was willing to negotiate down to allowing a single member to issue a motion to vacate the chair. Uh, and then, as Robert pointed out, then you replace something with nothing. And that's easy. Anybody can do that. It's, uh, Robert pointed out, it's like it burning the bridge and away you go. And uh, I always say, uh, hey, the bridges you burn light your way. And I think that's what we've been seeing in the chaos of Congress. And so to require those with that motion to vacate, also saying who they would appoint or who they would nominate as the successor, I think completely changes the conversation. That's worth thinking about. We'll be right back. Advertising used to be simple. Your options were radio, TV, newspaper, and let's not forget the yellow pages. Now it seems like a tidal wave of options. Podcast, cable TV, streaming, OTT, CTV, audio network, smart speakers. On top of that, you need digital marketing for your website along with SEM, SEO, display, video, YouTube, email, and all the social media platforms. Look, you're the expert in your business. Wouldn't it be nice to have an expert to market you? We are Bonneville Salt Lake, the local marketing and media company you know and trust. We reach customers across all digital and social platforms and have the reach of traditional advertising available as well. We find your customer anytime, any place, anywhere on any device here in Utah or anywhere in the world. We work to optimize your results with our in-house local team of experts, providing you with qualified leads, not just impressions. Contact Stephanie Palmer at KSL for a free consultation including a complete digital audit with no obligation or cost to you email s palmer at ksl.com that's s palmer at ksl.com you can host the best backyard barbecue when you find a professional on angie to make your backyard the best around connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well inside to outside Repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. Are you prepared for an emergency or disaster? Because it's not a matter of if, but when. Don't find yourself saying, <laughs> When the storm rolls in, my time to find a pet-friendly evacuation center will have run out. The scorching heat wave will leave me powerless to cool my insulin. I'll face a hurricane without meds. Now that's a tough pill to swallow. Let's prepare so we all have a better story to tell. Get started at ready.gov slash older adults. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Josh loves springtime in Utah, but he hates to paint, so he called Rhino Shield. We have a cedar-sided home at the edge of the woods, painted 
like 1980s beige, and uh, we wanted something that was more of a mid-century and modern look. We were driving around and we saw a sign in somebody's yard and uh, said, Rhino Shield, it's not paint. Rhino Shield ceramic technology is formulated for our unique climate here in Utah and is class one fire rating. Gave Rhino Shield a call, and in fact, they were fantastic with the arrangement on schedule. The 25 year guarantee was important to us. This is our forever home, and we want to make sure that whatever we're doing is going to last a long time. Utah, you can have the 25 year guarantee protection of Rhino Shield for 15% off the regular price. I'd say if you're thinking about Rhino Shield, just do it. It's been two years now, and it still looks like the day it went on. This offer is limited, so call 435 246 4466. 435 246 4466 or rhinoshieldwest.com. Does your business struggle with ISO, SOC 2, HIPAA, CMMC, NIST, or other compliance? Register now for the WebCheckSecurity.com Cyber Summit. That's WebCheckSecurity.com. Looking for a secure retirement plan without market risk? Look no further. Lyle Boss, president of Boss Financial, specializes in no market risk retirement strategies with guarantees of principal, guaranteed growth, and lifelong income. Join Lyle right here each Saturday and Sunday for his safe money radio show and call him now at 855-355-SAFE for your complimentary customized safe money information kit and safe money book. Nothing but upside here at 855-355-SAFE. Imagine this. You're at home, at work, or at school, and you hear a low rumble. Things are falling and breaking. You feel scared and confused. What do you do? How do you protect yourself and your loved ones? Earthquakes are a real and serious threat in Utah. According to the Utah Geological Survey, there's a 57% chance of a magnitude 6.0 or greater earthquake occurring in the Wasatch Front region in the next 50 years. That's why we invite you to join the world's largest earthquake drill, the Great Utah Shakeout, on April 18th, and practice the proven and recommended protective action. Drop cover and hold on. Register at shakeout.org slash Utah and be counted with over 1 million people in Utah who will drop, cover, and hold on at 1015 a.m. on April 18th. The Great Utah Shakeout is for everyone and is an initiative of the Utah Division of Emergency Management. Find excellent resources to plan your drill and to prepare for an earthquake at shakeout.org slash Utah. You know, Deb, you and I have had this conversation so many times. We think, oh, I wish I had a little more light here or maybe a ceiling fan there. That's why we love Master Electrical. So anytime we have an electrical problem, we know we can call them and they will give us their upfront pricing guarantee. Because we're not going to do it yourself. We're going to leave it to the professionals. And this upfront pricing guarantee is fantastic. I'm sure you've been bitten by bids in the past where they say, oh, that's going to take half a day. And then two weeks later... The bid and the invoice have nothing to do with each other. Not only will you get their upfront pricing guarantee, but you will never see an upcharge. Their pricing system simply won't allow it. Master Electrical proudly serves from Logan to Santa Quin. They do everything that has to do with electrical, and they're always open, including for emergency services. The phone number to call is 801-543-2222. 801-543-2222 or check them out online at masterelectrical.com. Hello, Spring. This is your friend, Adventure. You've been on my mind and I'm wondering where you've been. Weather's warming and a word on the street is you're looking for riders to enjoy Cedar City Brinehead Spectacular Trails? Well, I'm told Three Peaks Recreation and Parawam's Evil Water Trail System are the bomb. Or perhaps you've changed. Maybe you're more into hiking? Kolob Canyon or Thor's Hammer Trail make a perfect meetup place. Oh, oh, and don't forget Cedar City's spectacular views accompanied by disc golf at the Thunderbird Garden Course. Listen, I've always been here. I still like the same things. Spring skiing, tubing, but I'm more mature now. Uh, my interests have expanded. There's Cedar City's Southern Utah Museum of Art, strolls downtown, fine dining or shopping. I'm more interesting than you know. Let's connect and rekindle our relationship starting in the spot we always enjoy. Cedar City Brian Head. Look me up at visitcedarcity.com. Your old friend, Adventure. People decide to lose weight for all different kinds of reasons. I mean, I, I interviewed someone.
told me that 30% of all Utahns are pre-diabetic. Maybe it's your health, or maybe it's the fact that summer's gonna be here any day and you got a wedding this summer and you just wanna feel more confident in your dress as the mother of the bride or the father of the bride. And you know that's what's happening in my life uh, this summer with my daughter who lost 42 pounds on this great program. You talk about feeling confident. If you're the bride, that's your day. People do it for all different reasons, like Jim. You know, I have the family history of, of family members being obese, and I did not want that. And I figured now would be a, a good time that I could take control of something. So whatever the reason is for you, today is the day to start the Soda Weight Loss Program. Yeah, it's nice to know that message is getting out. And really, if people see you as good as you look today, they will want to get in on the program, too. It is Soda Weight Loss. Go to SodaWeightLoss.com, which stands for... State of the art. It is state of the art. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, gunfire broke out in a mosque in Philadelphia at a celebration marking the end of Ramadan. A 15-year-old was wounded. Second, Utah's first lady is recovering from spinal surgery. And third, the first day of arguments and witness testimony are wrapping up in Chad Daybell's murder trial in Boise. 59 degrees and sunny in Salt Lake City. And back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Get deeper insights on the news from Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson. As we round out the program, we actually started today, uh, of course, with the big summit taking place with uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida of Japan. And they will have a big state dinner tonight. And then, of course, tomorrow they will have a trilateral summit uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister Marcos from the Philippines as well. Again, all important in that region of the world. Uh, But really interesting, just uh, listening uh, to Prime Minister Kishida today uh, always brings back a lot of uh, connections to Japan for me. And the thing that I kept going back to as I was listening to a lot of the subtleties and a lot of the details that Prime Minister Kishida was uh, sharing in his comments today was this whole thing of of small and the little incremental pieces that actually make the biggest difference. We live in this society where bigger is always better. Uh, Every day the world uh, turns on really small and seemingly insignificant acts by very ordinary people. Uh, but yet we're always focused on how do we make it bigger? How do we make it better? How do we make it broader? And I think there's actually a significance to the insignificant. Understanding the power of what the world would deem as uh, insignificant actions, while also uh, really understanding the insignificance of our own place in the world. I think we all felt that a little bit uh, with all the coverage of the eclipse on Monday. And so when we look at this, uh, I always go back uh, to when I was in Japan back in 1985, and uh, I remember meeting uh, a man there by the name of Yamaguchi. Uh, He was 94 years old. We had a lovely chat and discussion on a wide range of things. Uh, He was absolutely brilliant. Uh, We actually solved all the world's problems in a single afternoon. It uh, It was an epic day for me. Uh, but as we were getting ready to leave uh, his home, he stopped me and he said, you know, boy, all these things we've talked about, all these principles are good and right. They'll help people be successful and happy. He said, but there's one more principle that you have to understand. And he actually made me a promise. He said, I want you to promise me that you'll remember this principle and never forget it. And I said, okay, I, I promise I'll, I'll remember. Uh, and this is what he said. He said, Zo to you know, kamude wa nai kero, mushi to you know, kamude aro. And uh, with that, he closed the door behind us, and I was walking down the street trying to figure out what he really meant, translating it back and forth between English and Japanese. And it was a, a really simple saying Elephants don't bite, but fleas do. Elephants don't bite, but fleas do. And I go back to that principle all the time. The big things in life tend to take care of themselves. But often it's what we do with the little things that either holds us back or really propels us forward to the accomplishment of a goal or an objective. Uh, Look at the Olympic Games. Uh, Olympic Games, it always comes down to a fraction of a point, hundredth of a second, width of a bike tire, length of a skate that usually makes the difference between being the gold medal champion and someone who just participated. It's that close. It's those little things. And so as we look at the big issues of our day, Uh, I think a lot of those can be solved by a a lot of very small issues that each of us can do every day. 
because we have to remember that it is community and culture that lead the politics and the policy will follow uh, if we do what we need to do in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities. Because it, it is those small things. Uh, and to me, it's the small and insignificant, seemingly insignificant, that are the things that are actually most important. Uh, and it actually got me thinking back um, a couple of years ago. It was the funeral of former uh, President George H.W. Bush. And uh during his funeral service, which was just a, an extraordinary thing there at the National Cathedral, there was a story told of a very small, a very humble act of service performed by one of President Bush's friends and former Secretary of State, James Baker. Uh, they talked about how Secretary Baker was at the foot of the president's bed uh, often as uh, the president uh, spent his last days and hours and that James Baker uh, rubbed and stroked the president's feet uh, for almost an hour. And I remember watching that funeral, uh, and as uh, this story was told, the cameras panned over to, uh, to where James Baker was sitting, and he just very quietly just had his head bowed and was just sobbing. Uh, and he said as he watched this play out, uh, the president smiled uh, at James Baker. And I had this vision of here you had a world leader, James Baker, who was serving someone who had been the world's leader of the free world, the former president. And I thought that was just such a, an interesting moment uh, and just how something as simple as that uh, could make such a big difference. And I think we all have to maybe think again about what we think we know about what we do every day, because it may be as insignificant as going to pick up somebody's child from school when they're sick or shoveling dirt for a neighbor uh, who's got a big pile to move. Um, But it's all those little things that make the big things pretty insignificant. We can get wrapped up in the news of the day. We can have heartburn over the the headaches in Washington, D.C. We can get stressed out about social media. Uh, But what have we done that just makes a difference today? Because in the end, those seemingly insignificant things are the most significant things. They're the things that will change your day. They're the things that will change your world. They're the things that will make a difference for somebody else as well. And that's what's most significant. Well, that wraps it up for us on Inside Sources today here on KSL News Radio. Thanks for joining us. I am Boyd Matheson. And as always, as you go out into the world today, make sure you see something that inspires, say something that uplifts, and do something that makes a difference. KSL FM Midvale. KSL Salt Lake City. From the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. This is KSL News Radio. Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Good afternoon, 3 o'clock at KSL News Radio. I'm Jeff Kaplan. 61 degrees, KSL's top story. The delegation from the IOC is here. If you're listening, Vilkomen, bienvenidos, welcome. They're getting a first chance to size up the biggest venues we'd use 10 years from now for the Winter Olympics. KSL News Radio's Eric Cabrera 